All right, so um, uh, like a number of the speakers, I am back here again for the second time. Uh, I, for, I was here first four or five years ago, and so as, in a sense, as someone who's grown up in this community and the free software communities uh, you know, more broadly, it's an honor to be invited back here again and to give the opportunity to talk today. Um, what I wanted to do today is really talk about uh, you know, the, they have a provocative title, Access uh, Without Empowerment. And what I want to do is really walk through, uh, think of this as sort of like, a, like an ideological progress report for the free software movement more broadly. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to sort of talk about how I see free software's mission, like a huge number of other free culture and sort of uh, broader movements for free information, to fall down into a sort of two-part mission. The first being access, um, sort of promoting access access in the dissemination of knowledge and software in particular, and the second is um, in terms of empowerment, really sort of encouraging people to sort of take control of the software that they're using. What I want to do is suggest uh, in, you know, this sort of, in this progress report part, suggest that we're, that in terms of the first mission, in terms of promoting access, we're doing well, very well, and in fact getting better over time. But that in terms of the second mission, in terms of uh, sort of promoting empowerment, we're doing much less well, and that in many ways we're not improving, or at least not improving nearly as well as we are in terms of promoting access. I want to walk through why I think it is we've had these mixed results. Um, uh, sort of to talk through a series of systematic reasons that I've identified in the context of our movements and our advocacy and the way in which we structure and engage more broadly um, that we have privileged access and sort of as a result led to victories in terms of access that have not been followed by similar victories in terms of empowerment. And then I want to sort of end by pointing to three sets of strategies that, uh, that, 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 that we might be able to adopt to do better in terms of this in the future. All right. So uh, when I give talks like this uh, and uh, you know, uh, when I'm sort of talking about free software mission, it's worth going back to the beginning, which is to say the free software definition and we start out uh, uh, this is one of these things I've sort of been repeated to me so many times and repeated to other people so many times I can do it in my sleep. But of course, the four freedoms that most of you are going to be familiar with, uh, we start counting at zero because that's really funny if you're a programmer. Uh, um, but of course, the, fr the freedom zero is the freedom to uh, use software for any purpose. The second freedom is the freedom to study um, uh, software, to see the source code, to understand how it works. The um, second freedom is, is the freedom to sort of share um, and redistribute copies more broadly. And then, the, and then the, the freedom three, the fourth freedom, is the freedom to collaborate, to share our changes with others, and to benefit as a community more broadly. But as I've su su suggested, um, I think that these four freedoms actually come down to, 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 to two fundamental types of freedom, right? Two categories of freedom more broadly. Um, uh, the, the first is really about access. And this is a quote from the GNU Manifesto that's, uh, that suggests, you know, this is a Stallman writing, I consider the golden rule requires that if a program, that if I like a program, I must share it with other people who like it. Software sellers want to divide the users and conquer them, making each user agree not to share it with others. I refuse to break solidarity with uh, other users in this way. This idea here that, that if I have something that I like, that I should that, that it's sort of the, the, the golden rule, it's something we learned in kindergarten, that if someone asks me for a copy, I should not, I should be able to say, sure, yeah, I want to share that with you, right? But this, this form right here, in some ways, is actually kind of like the weak form of the argument. Uh, Eben Moglen, who uh, some of you uh, may have run into or had the privilege of here speak, um, gives a much stronger form of this argument that's based on the idea that software, like other information goods, has what he calls, you know, what economists call zero marginal cost, um, which is to say that uh, as an information good, if I it may take a lot of effort or energy to produce it, but that once I've produced that piece of software, the cost of giving a copy of that software to another person is zero, effectively zero. Uh, the, the, and so uh, Moglen draws a comparison to a machine that could make food, right? If I could make a machine that could produce and distribute food to a hungry person by pressing a button, um, Moglen suggests there would be no ethical justification for hunger in a world in which that machine exists, right? It may cost a trillion dollars to make that machine, but once that machine exists, Starvation is no longer ethically justifiable. Right now, for the, for information goods like software, right, um, that is 
the context in which we're in. Once it may, you know, we may take a huge amount of energy and effort that goes into producing software, but once that software exists, everyone anywhere can have it, right? Um, and like all information goods, anyone everywhere can have a piece of software for the same cost that it takes to produce it for one person. And so Moglin suggests that, uh, that, that in this sense, it, it is a ethical imperative that we be able to share software more broadly. That's the, that's the argument that he makes. Um, that's a very strong version of the argument, but there's a weaker form that just suggests that sharing is, uh, that, that sharing is good, and um, uh, either one of these uh, leads to this, to, to this same kind of argument, if not in the same degree. All right. Um, the, 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 the second type of freedom really comes down to, uh, to empowerment, right? Um, and empowerment really uh, uh, means not only that people should have access to this stuff, that it should be able to be disseminated widely, but that people should be able to change the software to do what they want. I um, mean, this is really um, where I think a lot of the rhetoric around free software kind of gets it wrong, because um, there's a sense in which software freedom doesn't matter at all. The software doesn't need freedom. The software you know, wants to, you know, information doesn't want anything. Um, so, uh, that what matters is the users, the freedom of the users. Um, and, uh, and it's the people the people who are using software um, who matter in this sense. It's about people, um, I'm talking about this in terms of empowerment, but lots of other um, terms that people have used to talk about this include things like autonomy or power. Um, and when I try to talk about this, I often give an example using my phone. So if I pick up my, you know, I'll show you my phone. If I want to send a message to uh, another person using my phone, I'm going to be constrained in terms of the kind of message that I can send by the technology of my phone, right? If I, if I want to, uh, like limited to being able to send text messages. I, I mean, I can write a, I can write a pretty good text message in not so much space. Um, uh, but I'm limited in terms of the nature of the message. If I can call someone to, you know, tell them how great this conference is, I can sing a song. I can send a different kind of message. If my phone can take a picture and I can send that picture and you can receive it, then I can send a different kind of message. The point is that the that that all, all of these things are you know, technological decisions that someone made, either in terms of hardware or very frequently in terms of software. And the nature of those decisions constrains very explicitly the kind of message that I can send with this device, right? And to the extent that this device mediates my experience of the world, the question of who controls that device and what it can and can't do is, the, is a question of who controls my experience of the world and other people, right? And so uh, insofar as our lives are increasingly mediated by devices like this, or like this, the question of who controls those device, devices or who controls what they can and can't do becomes an increasingly important political question, right? And free software in this sense, freedoms zero, two, and three, or one, three, and four, depending on uh, how geeky we want to be as we're counting them, suggests an answer, right? The answer is you or users, right? The users of software, insofar as our experience of the world is mediated by these technologies, it is important that users be able to control that technology and determine what it can and can't do. If we look at other movements, if we look at the Wikimedia movement, if we look at Creative Commons, if we look at uh, you know, you know, the open source definition, all of these things, um, uh, they have lots of different ways in which they describe essential freedoms or core parts of their mission, but all of them come down to these two core types of freedom, freedom to disseminate and sort of spread access, and also, um, and then a, a freedom or an ability to change and take control, not just be a consumer of sort of information uh, or information goods or software, but also a producer as well. All right. Now, uh, as I suggested, I want to do a little bit of a little progress report in terms of the movement in terms of these two, in terms of these two uh, broad uh, missions or these two broad types of freedoms. Now, in terms of the first, uh, uh, the, the, the first, which is to say uh, uh, access, I want to suggest that we're doing quite well. Um, that we've done a fantastic job in our movement of getting, uh, of disseminating uh, the stuff that we're writing, the software that we're writing, um, and that we've been doing good for a long time, and that as time goes on, we're doing doing better. Now, this is the sort of the classic uh, people have seen these uh, net craft. Uh, uh, market share uh, surveys or um, the sort of automatic surveys. These have been published for almost as long as I've been involved in the free software community. And the, um, they, for example, show a number of things. The most famous one was the proportion of web servers running different pieces of software. And of course, as long as these statistics have been kept, uh, free software has been dominated, uh, dominating. 
in, um, in terms of server-side scripting languages, you see something very similar. Uh, you know, that we're now, uh, it's not only the case that uh, Apache is the most uh, widely, you know, serving the vast majority of pages over time, it is now the case that even that number two is also free software. Nginx has surpassed the proprietary alternatives as the second most widely used web servers. Free software is completely dominant in this particular space. If we look, um, browsers are also uh, um, l largely free, of course, um, although Internet Explorer once held over 95% of market share after it squeezed Netscape uh, Navigator out illegally, of course, according to antitrust adjudicators in both Europe and the United States. Uh, the um, free software browsers, including Chrome and Firefox and Iceweasel, my favorite, uh, now hold uh, nearly half of the market. Um, recent industry surveys suggest that over 40% of firms engaged in free software development, uh, sorry, engaged in software development at all contribute to free or open source software projects as part of their work. Um, uh, free software in this space has been dominant for a long time and is continuing to do, um, and, and is in many cases doing even better. If you look at usage shares in terms of operating system, you can look down the list. Uh, you know, we are still, as it turns out, waiting for the year of uh, you know, GNU Linux on the desktop uh, any day now, um, but that in lots of other spaces, including uh, including uh, smartphones, including uh, servers um, uh, and supercomputers and embedded systems, uh, Linux-based operating systems in particular, but free software operating systems more general generally um, occupy enormous proportions of. Um, of, of market share. Lots and lots of people are in lots of different places using free software. You look at the growth curve, one of the you know, first places that free software was adopted in huge amounts was in supercomputing. Um, you can see that there's exponential growth starting in the, late, uh, in the late 1990s until, of course, we have to slow down because all of it um, is running free software, right? Um, it's hard to grow past 100% uh, or very close to it. Um, basically, all supercomputers today use um, uh, use some version of GNU Linux, um, uh, and you see similar growth in terms of servers. If you look at um, smartphone uh, share, you can see that Android-based operating systems go from almost nothing in 2009 and are today, and today make up a majority of all um, smartphones that are being used. You look at um, embedded systems, including televisions. Your television, if it's a relatively recent one, uh, probably runs some version of the Linux kernel. Um, and an operating system based on free software bits and pieces. Um, of course, because free software has been so dominant in this you know, sort of very quickly growing space, I mean, you can say uh, we, are, we are moving very quickly towards a period of time when there will be more than two billion Linux devices um, um, in the world, the vast majority of them uh, mobile phones running Android. Um, but if you think about this in terms of the computers that people actually have, um, uh, that, that we, are, uh, we are close to or um, have recently surpassed a period of time where 50% of all computers in the world um, are actually running uh, Linux, uh, Linux kernels and um, operating systems which use the, the software that we as a movement have built. Um, uh, bits of uh, free software here. Um, now, the um, one problem with measuring the usage of free software more broadly is that it's actually very hard to see when people are using um, free software in many cases. When I worked at Canonical early on, um, uh, one thing, uh, part of my job was to grow our install base, our base of users and, um, and also developers. But in terms of measuring users, uh, people would ask how many users do we have? And I'd say, I have no idea, lots um, as far as we can tell. Um, we, uh, we did, um, uh, I was personally coordinated the mailing of millions of different Ubuntu CDs. Um, the CD company that was like producing our CDs was like so happy with how many CDs we were buying that they like made me this like framed like platinum CD. To, like uh, like send, I, like I didn't, I gave it to my parents. I'm like here, and they're like, we don't really know what you do, but like seems to be going great. Um, uh, our best measures were often based on things like NTP check-ins, so we could see how many computers were coming online and connecting to us. And even within the first few years of Ubuntu being launched, there were in the orders of tens of millions of users who, um, by our best um, measures, and we certainly made um, millions of uh, CDs which were distributed as well. Um, uh, there are lots and lots of people that are um, uh, using, uh, using free software. Here is just a graph from SourceForge. Um, 2009 was the last period of time where I could get good, um, good uh, data. But what we um, can see is that in terms, in, in terms of downloads, um, what you can see is that there were, you know, the important thing to keep in mind is that there are in the order of 50 million downloads a month during this period. People moved away from SourceForge in large, in large part, but, uh, but 
consumption of free software has not abated in other places. Um, there are huge, you know, millions, um, many tens of millions of people who are even outside of the stuff that comes installed on their devices, going out of their way to get and download and use free software of various different kinds. We are doing really well in terms of uh, access. Um, there are other places where we can, um, other sort of uh, similar movements where we can look at access to knowledge in places where measures are a little bit better because everybody who reads Wikipedia has to go to the Wikipedia website. Um, very, we have much better data, although still not perfect data on consumption of uh, pages there. If you, um, I, I'll show you this because I'm going to compare it to uh, you know, more measures of empowerment later. But if we look at growth of Wikipedia um, uh, readers over time, um, we can see that there are now uh, now, if you include mobile, this does not include mobile devices, which is part of why you see it, it, go, it go down there at the end, or mobile views. We are, um, there are uh, moving towards a billion people who are using Wikipedia each month. So in our, the broader free culture movement, we are doing very good at producing information, which we are able to disseminate very widely. So. Um, in terms of uh, access, we, are do we, we have been doing excellent for quite a long time. We have been building stuff that lots of people are using and consuming um, in various ways, and we are, along many metrics, doing better as we go um, uh, move forward in time. But control and ability to change and reuse is far less universal in the free culture and free software um, universes by a lot. Um, here is over the same period of time data from uh, on developer on the number of developers in terms of SourceForge, and this is a really like I don't know, whatever the opposite of a conservative estimate is. Um, this is this is double this is the number of people um, who are sort of developers on a project, and it's double counting everybody. This is if you this is assuming that no one on SourceForge has ever joined more than one project, which is not true. I'm participating in many. This is assuming that. Uh, um, uh, nobody is inactive on SourceForge, which of course, um, if you've participated in any one of the, in any free software community, is also not true. This is like an incredibly generous estimate. Um, and what we see is that the number of active users using this very generous, or, and sorry, the number of contributors um, is in the order of hundreds of thousands. Um, uh, that's to say a couple, of hun uh, a couple hundred downloads per developer every single month. GitHub has um, somewhere over 9 million users as of the last time that I checked. Um, and of course, this includes lots of proprietary um, uh, software developers. One challenge with GitHub, which is why I don't have data from them, is getting a sense of the GitHub project's users base because it's very, it's very hard because many projects on GitHub are not distributed from GitHub. Um, so, for, so for example, if I write an Android app and I you know, post the source code in GitHub, almost no one will download my Android app from GitHub um, because you can't run an Android app in its source form. You get it through a uh, store, probably the Google Play Store. Um, and as a result, it's hard to measure that. Um, that said, uh, um, uh, uh, that said, the rapid growth of free software, as we've seen before, suggests that a majority of these uh, you know, phones are running Android and are installing apps which are available online. We don't need to, um, we don't, and, and to the extent that the vast majority of people who are running these things like apps on Android um, are, are consuming them on Android, we don't really have to speculate about the exact proportion of free software users who, engage, who are engaged in modifying their software because a majority of users, which is to say the large majority of users whose only computers are Android devices, can't modify the software that's running on their devices, even if they, even if they have access to all of the source code. Because of course, an Android phone can't modify its own software in and of itself. Um, uh, th th they're not designed to, for one, in the sense that they don't have affordances or the development tools installed by default. But they're also locked down so that even if you wanted to, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, the, the, you walk into a Google or a, I don't know, a company of people writing Android apps, and you see a bunch of people sitting around and using computers. Um, now, of course, if you were to walk into an uh, office of people writing software to run on laptops, they would also be a bunch of people sitting around using laptop computers, right? But this situation in the past, where the systems we use to develop software were also the systems we use to write software, meant that people could transcend that role in a way that users of devices that are locked down so that they can't run software, and so that are designed so that they can't change software anyway. Um, uh, uh, means that the vast majority of people um, simply can't, which brings us to sort of the, um, you know, this is the this is the, the the last point here, which is that this is the the measure of contributorship to Wikipedia again since 2007, which is the period of time that there's good viewership information. It shows just the 
sort of the number of uh, editors over here. And you can see that since 2007, Wikipedia um, has uh, has a, ed a editor base, which is decreasing slightly, but is um, more or less uh, holding constant. Um, and that uh, at its, um, but but the the key point is the graph over here, which is the percentage of readers um, who engage in editing the, the site. So that this is basically that previous graph, the number of uh, readers, or, uh, sorry, this is the this graph right here divided by that graph of the number of readers. And what you can see, of course, is that although the number of contributors to Wikipedia has more or less held constant since 2007 or gone down a little bit, that the proportion of readers has gone, um, has been halved. That we're now looking at, that, that, that there used to be one in about, uh, one in a thousand, let's say, uh, um, or one in a couple thousand users uh, of Wikipedia would engage in editing or contribution. And today it's half that, maybe one in five or one in 6,000 people ever sort of change anything. That the number, that uh, a smaller portion of people are, a uh, proportion of people who are accessing free knowledge are sort of engaging in the, the, the freedom they have to change that stuff, to, um, uh, to, to build, to become not just consumers, but producers. All right. So um, the second thing, uh, um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the update, right? Um, good in terms of access, um, uh, in terms of promoting access, less good in terms of promoting empowerment, at least in terms of the way in which our movement has defined it. Um, but I want to talk about why I think this has um, uh, been this way, to talk about why empowerment is so much harder than access. And I've come up with, I think, five different um, de um, descriptions or, or explanations. The first is that um, uh, the first is that access is uh, always sort of step one. That in order to promote, sort of, if we if, if our goal is to promote, even if our goal is only to promote empowerment, that we first need to give people access to stuff so that they can then change it. And as a result, our advocacy has, um, like, as a as a broader movement, has focused on promoting access uh, first. Um, lots of uh, uh, this is a picture of an install party. Um, who here first installed uh, GNU Linux at an install party? Was it me? Was I? No. Who here's run an install party or been to one? A few people, right? I've definitely uh, been to install parties as well. Um, uh, uh, I can't remember if I first installed it that way. Um, here's a picture of one in Stavropol. Uh, um, I've participated and organized in various um, ways in a number of these. Uh, I uh, and you know my local uh, Linux user group in Seattle organizes one every month or two, and people show up to install it that way. Um, uh, uh, we've, in terms of our sort of like the work of our advocacy organizations, it's something that we've made a very important part of the way in which we uh, reach out to people. We have not, for the most part, run similar types of hack on your operating system parties. Um, uh, uh, not because you couldn't, um, but I've never uh, not seen that as, as often. Uh, it's certainly gonna be pointed to you know, addressing a smaller group of people. Um, uh, it certainly requires more specialized skills, but it's not something that generally speaking we, we have. I will talk about some examples of people who've done that a little bit later on. Um, uh, in terms of our outreach and advocacy, this is stuff from Software Freedom Day, a picture, pictures from Software Freedom Day. Uh, last time I gave uh, some version of this talk, the person who was in that picture was like, that's me, um, was in the audience. Um, I have stood in you know, local squares in my cities and handed out CDs to people, CDs running either open CDs, running lots of pieces of free software that could be installed on you know, proprietary operating systems or installed uh, CDs with free operating systems. As I've suggested, I have sent, you know, helped send millions of CDs to people um, that were interested in passing those out to people and engaging in, uh, engaging in promoting the adoption of, the dissemination of free software um, very explicitly. These are valuable forms of outreach because of course using free software is a first step, right? But for the most part, that's where our advocacy, uh, you know, our advocacy has not taken, gone steps beyond just the dissemination of, uh, of software more broadly in that way. Um, uh, uh, I have participated, as I'm sure a number of you have, in spreading the word or um, documenting getfirefox.com. This is geticeweasel.com. Iceweasel is the Debian version of Firefox, and it has a very cute logo. Um, and this is, it's a very funny website because the only way to install Iceweasel is to just apt-get install it on your system. Um, so it's just like a website that tells you to do that. Um, uh, um, uh, all of these, you know, 
get Firefox is about spreading the word of uh, spreading the word about a free software browser that you can install, and it's been enormously effective in terms of uh, spreading the word and increasing access to this free browser in this way. Um, but uh, hackfirefox.com, if it exists, or some version with that, some. Some concept, something that is conceptually similar uh, to, ha to, ha to hackfirefox.com is, if it exists at all, far, far less possible. Now, all three of these, I think, uh, you know, these install parties and outreach events and uh, things like Get Firefox are valuable forms of outreach because using free software is a necessary first step. Um, but we shouldn't stop there. And in each of these cases, that's exactly where I, to the extent that I have engaged in this work, have stopped. Um, we need to uh, focus on advocacy within our communities to ensure that users can take advantage of all of the freedoms, right? The, the, both of these core two types of freedom, all of the four freedoms, and we very rarely do. All right. Uh, the second reason why I think that we've pr really privileged access over empowerment in terms of our, uh, in terms of our advocacy is uh, that there are very often uh, subtle social compromises, sometimes a little bit less subtle. Uh, I'm going to uh, sort of retreat a little bit into my, uh, my sort of day job as an academic studying free software and free culture communities. Um, and I want to touch a little bit on uh, a piece of work that I've done which uh, s uses the Scratch online community. People here use Scratch. You know, Scratch, Scratch is a, it's a, it's a uh, programming language which is uh, self-written in small talk. It's designed for kids and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a sort of graphical block-based programming language, so you sort of can't make a syntactical error. Your program probably doesn't won't do what you want the first time, but it will always run. Um, Scratch is also an online community where kids can share the programs that they've used, and then, and then and every piece of software released on the Scratch website is released under a free license, under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license, so that everyone in Scratch can take someone else's program and uh, sort of build off it. Uh, if, if they can sort of change it, they can use it in different ways. Now, uh, one thing we've looked at in Scratch is when uh, is the sort of the criteria that cause the criteria associated with projects being more sort of uh, generative or um, popular. And so the trade-off here uh, that I want to talk about is one that I sort of explored in my research, which is a trade-off between generativity, which is to say the qualities of Scratch projects that make them more likely to be uh, sort of hacked on or a sort of uh, remixed. Um, and uh, that's the first column here. And there's a series of uh, there's a series of different uh, things that we measured. Uh, one is, for example, how uh, sort of popular or high status the author is within the community. One is how cumulative the project is, which is to say, is it like a remix of a remix of a remix? Um, uh, and then the third will have to do with how complex the project is. But the important thing here is that along all three of these dimensions, we find that the qualities associated with increased generativity in the sense of the, thing, the, 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 the qualities associated with increased engagement and reuse, uh, the kind of empowerment that we're trying to um, provide, uh, that we're trying to sort of facilitate in the broader free software community, but also in Scratch, are all associated with, uh, with less, sort of sort of like with less original forms of remixing, which is to say that the Project, we found that projects are more likely to be remixed if they are moderately complicated, sort of created by prominent users of cumulative, but that each of those things are associated with less original forms of remixing. And the story here is that the kinds of things that a designer could do, right, if you're designing uh, a community or if you're sort of creating a project, that the kinds of things that you, would, that you can do which will invite engagement are associated, um, are all associated with sort of they work by attracting people who are maybe less interested in changing things a lot, or less uh, interested, or or less able to change things a lot. That very often there are compromises that we as designers have to engage in. That mean that the cost of attracting more people to engagement or empowerment mean that that. that, that the nature of that engagement is weakened, right? It's a real compromise, um, which is something which uh, I've been able to show in some of this research. All right. The third kind of compromises uh, in terms of technological compromises, and these come in a bunch of different ways, and we're very familiar with them uh, uh, already. Uh, the most extreme version of this is just in terms of uh, TiVoization, which is to say that freedom is simply compromised in the sense that it is violated completely um, and users are simply made unfree. People are familiar with the concept of TiVoization. TiVo released 
a device which came with free software running on it, but was locked down using essentially DRM so that users of the TiVo, although they had access to all the code they needed necessary to change the software on their device, couldn't. They didn't have the keys, like literally the keys necessary to install the software on their device so that they could make it do something else. You have access to all the code that you need to change it, and yet you can't. Um, this, uh, 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 it's, you know, TiVoization is the example of when users have the rights under a license, but no ability in a practical sense to exercise those rights in practice. Um, and that this business model, right, this technique of, uh, of TiVoization has been uh, very popular more broadly. There's a pile of devices, all of which uh, run, or nearly all of which run Linux in some form and various other pieces of free software, and almost all of which are locked down in a way that, uh, that make them unmodifiable, at least without having to sort of attack and compromise your own device. Um, we are succeeding uh, in terms of spreading our stuff by spreading it in devices, not like this or like your television, that make realizing that freedom technologically impossible or at least extremely difficult. Uh, here's another uh, technological compromise uh, um, which is a little bit more subtle. People familiar with Wikipedia Zero? Wikipedia Zero is a project launched by the Wikimedia Foundation which makes access to Wikipedia free for users in large parts of the developing world. They essentially make agreements with telecommunication providers in the developing world to say that when that, that, that people want to access Wikipedia from their mobile devices that they won't be charged for that access, that it's free for them and no cost. Um, uh, and this is great in the sense that this means that, you know, the world's knowledge is accessible to, you know, as, as reflected in Wikipedia, is, is accessible to huge numbers of people around the world. And yet the nature of that, the nature of that access um, uh, is, is compromised because when Wikipedia Zero first launched initially, there was no way to edit Wikipedia from a mobile device, right? I mean, this is like a very clear technological compromise. It's still, it is now the case that you can edit Wikipedia from a mobile device, but it is much harder. And that some of the, many of the features that, that sort of many of the most active editors on Wikipedia use, take advantage of, to edit Wikipedia effectively are simply not available to users of mobile devices. To mobile devices. That we have in our desire to spread access more widely in the case of we, I'm also very involved in the Wikimedia community, um, we have decided to trade off users' ability to engage in production as well. All right. Uh, a fourth uh, sort of answer to why comes down to what I call sort of second order digital divides. And uh, there's a great piece of work by Esther Hargitay and Aaron Shaw, both at Northwestern University, that um, uh, again looks in at, uh, at uh, looks at the gender gap within Wikipedia. So this is a, uh, a gender gap in Wikipedia. You may have heard that the vast majority of people who contribute to Wikipedia are, uh, uh, are male. Uh, and this has been seen within that community as a problem. There's a very similar conversation that's been happening in the free software community for, uh, for a very long time. I can sort of look around the room and get a sense that you know, there's still work to be done in many ways. Uh, uh, the, uh, their, uh, Hargitay and Shaw's work has actually suggested that, that, that a big portion of, of the gender gap, at least in the context of Wikipedia, actually comes down to a skills gap. That, that, if, you, that if you take into advantage, that, that, that an important variable that we haven't looked at is the fact that there are many people who, many people who have access to a particular information good don't have the skills necessary to do it. And Wikipedia is a kind of a nice example because contributing to Wikipedia is supposedly much easier than contributing to um, free and open source software in the sense that you don't need to know a programming language. You just can, you just have to know how to press the edit button and make a change. And yet those technical, the technical skill gap means that, uh, that, that there's, uh, mean that large numbers of users um, uh, of Wikipedia, including many of the sort of the, the other kinds of demographic gaps that the community cares about, are uh, actually keeping these uh, people from being able to participate. The many people don't, 
um, until we address this, this inequality in terms of uh, sort of skills, not just having the stuff, but also having the skills necessary to take advantage of, uh, of, of it, uh, which is to say, and you know, we can talk about what those skills would be in the, in the context of free software, but they would certainly involve some level of programming. These broader forms of inequality are going, are going to continue in terms of contribution and empowerment. All right. The fifth and final reason why I think that we've struggled to, uh, to we struggled to address empowerment while succeeding in terms of action has to do with um, project life cycles. Here is a uh, graph that shows the number of people who are members of the Debian private email list. This is not exactly the number of uh, Debian developers or people that are sort of empowered members of the project um, over time, but it does capture, uh, but, but, it, but it correlates very strongly um, to to this, um, what you can see, of course, is that like many projects, Debian had some kind of, you know, exponential growth um, for a period of time. Lots and lots of people um, joining the project, and then um, over uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, the that growth slowed down. I mean, actually, during a period of time, Debian developers felt that they were growing too fast and just cut off like new contributor, like joining um, altogether. The uh, um, and, 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 but, and, and these sorts of life cycles are very common. You see growth of projects up to some certain, up to a certain point, and then you often see that they change in the sense that the projects sort of solidify over time. There's a group of people who are um, able to work together. Uh, they, we have sets of norms that we know. Uh, there are things like um, groups that I, I've shown in some of my other research that lots of free software and free culture projects actually become oligarchic in the sense that uh, there's a small group of people present at the beginning whose interests begin to diverge from those of many of the membership. I've shown this in wikis, but there's reason to believe that this exists in free software projects as well. Um, getting a patch in can be harder. And some of these are good, um, some of these sometimes for good reasons. The project has become more stable. The project has become more widely used. It's more important that we maintain sort of stability um, in the project. And some of these are less good in the sense that people want to sort of preserve their own power. But in either cases, we have projects that uh, th there is, there, there are life cycles that mean that it becomes more difficult to contribute to projects as they grow older and larger and more established. And that, that uh, this, and to the extent that free software has grown in this way, this may mean that it is harder along many dimensions to contribute to many particular free software projects and maybe to uh, establish free software projects in general than it was at some period in the past. All right. Um, so that sort of leaves us with the sort of final question of what is it that we should do about that? And I have four answers. Um, uh, the first uh, thing we could do is nothing, of course. Um, and you can probably guess that that's not the position I'm going to argue for. Uh, and if you guess that, you would be right. But uh, um, I think it's not so obviously wrong that it's not worth addressing. Um, because I realize, like, I, I really do that empowerment it doesn't mean that everyone has to become a programmer, right? Um, and, and if you really believe that not everyone, if you, you know, one answer is, well, not everyone needs to be a programmer. Why should we care about engagement in this sense? Why should we care about empowerment, right? If everyone has it, and all the people, that, the vast majority of people that, that, that have this stuff don't want to, you know, they don't, they don't want to be empowered in the way that you're talking about. Why do you want to go out and force them, right? Um, and uh, uh, because after all, right, freedom of the press, right, is another the freedom that many people believe in. It doesn't mean that we all need to go start newspapers, right? And if we say that not everyone's running a newspaper, that like, like that doesn't mean that the place is not free. Um, the GNU Manifesto frequently suggests that even if you can't program, you might be able to hire someone to program for you. And I think that that's absolutely right. Um, uh, the important thing after all is not that everyone needs to be hacking on free software, but that everyone has the freedom to do it, right? Um, it's the freedom to do it as opposed to the realization of that. Um, that said, I think it's hard to believe that you lived in a country with a free press if there were no independent, if there were no independent newspapers, or very, very few, or only certain kinds of people, let's say sort of rich people, male people, people in the developed world who ran newspapers. It would be hard to believe that that was free as well. And I think that, but I sort of think of, um, I, and I, I sort of think of empowerment in this sense, or about learning, to, or about programming, as as kind of in terms of writing or literacy, right? Um, uh, many many users of free software, because um, uh, many users of free software have never considered changing their their pieces of th their software to do something different. Now. Um, 
I, I, so in terms of the, the comparison with literacy is sort of like this. Um, although, although it's important that, the, imagine a world in which everyone knew how to read, but only a very small number of people knew how to write. That seems like that would be a sort of less than ideal world, that it wouldn't be democratic in some sense, right? But that kind of, you know, to the extent that we think that, that, that software uh, or technology is an important kind of literacy, um, that is kind of a, the world that we live in now, right? So, but, but, but that, that said, the, 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 end, the end result is not a world in which everyone is a professional programmer any more than we teach everyone to write because we think that it's important that everyone become a journalist or a novelist, right? Um, the important part is that that process be demystified enough that people feel that writing is something that they could do. Um, uh, and the, uh, it's important, in, 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 so for the reasons that I think it's important to teach people to read and write, I think it's important to teach people who use software to at least understand how they would transcend their roles as consumers. The reality is, is that learning to program really is empowering. Being able to change how your world works um, yourself is empowering. That empowerment is the promise of free software and that we should uh, not be willing to treat it only as a potential freedom. All right. Now, the second sense in the, the second sense in which I think we can address this gap, the gap between our success in terms of access and our success in terms of empowerment, is by compromising. Right? Sometimes we may simply have to choose. We may have to sacrifice efficiency in various ways by, for example, dealing with newcomers. I sometimes joke that like GNU Linux is the least efficient operating system ever sort of imagined. We have to spend like all of this time arguing with these people who are obviously wrong, right? I think they're, <laughs> I, I think they're obvious. I, I think the people who disagree with me are obviously wrong, right? And that we have to go through this process of, uh, you know, of negotiation, which is not as easy as it could be, right? And that by, uh, and that by sort of facilitating engagement of lots of new users, it means that we have to spend time dealing with sort of challenges or convincing people of things that we wouldn't have to do if we were to not be as open as, or as a sort of allow, encourage people to be as empowered in the sense of engaging in our projects. Um, the, uh, that, that may in various ways mean that we have to, that, that we should compromise quality, for example, um, uh, in order to promote engagement. There are tough choices that we will have to make if we want to promote, if we want to make empowerment of users a first order goal on the same level of access. Um, and the figuring out how to negotiate that is something which is uh, uh, tricky, but it's something that I think um, we need to, we need to be willing to make. Ch compromise, I think we should be willing to make. Uh, the third thing we can do is remove systematic barriers to participation. We can, we can uh, uh, work uh, in, in, do this in various ways. We can work to make our projects systematically more accessible to newcomers. And we can reject unacceptable trade-offs between access and empowerment if they're um, uh, uh, in, in, in various ways. So for example, lots of organizations have, or free software organizations have adapted, uh, adopted codes of conduct explicitly designed to make their projects more welcoming to large numbers of people, including people who are not participating before. Lots of conferences and organizations have adopted anti-harassment policies, which systematically are trying to make, in, uh, make it clear that, 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 that s systematic barriers to participation that have existed in the past um, should be should, should be removed to allow more people to engage. There are also lots of ways in which we have promoted outreach more broadly. So if people are familiar with Outreachy, which is a uh, nonprofit which essentially uh, f uh, funds people to participate in free and open source software development from groups of people. Historically, this was originally the, the um, outreach program for women, um, promoted uh, sort of women's engagement as developers and contributors in the GNOME project and now in a variety of different free software projects. There are a series of ways, and because of course economic Inequality is one way is is one way in which lots of people are prevented from engaging. There's a sense in which I grew up very privileged. I had a computer at home. I was able to, you know, I never took a computer science class. For me, development, software development, was something that I engaged in recreationally because I didn't have to have, for example, a, a job uh, after after school and high school. Um, I had space to explore this in ways in which to engage. And existing, uh, and there are now a series of projects which are making, which are in various ways making it possible for people who have historically not been able to contribute to free software for lots of systematic and economic reasons to be able to do so. And Outreachy is a, one example of a project which is doing that very effectively. All right. 
The fourth and what I think is probably the single most important thing we can do to address uh, this gap between access uh, and empowerment is basically around education and technology education. And there's a, a whole bunch of ways in which this happens. I have, over the last uh, two years, been running a series of projects called the computer, the, the um, this is computing, it should be the community data science workshops, a series of uh, efforts to uh, to basically teach absolute newcomers with no background at all how to program in Python, how to uh, pull data sets from web APIs, how to um, ask and answer questions that they have um, about online communities that they are participating in, free culture and free software communities in particular, but really, but really anything more broadly. We have, uh, we have taught 250 uh, people uh, how to program using a curriculum which is available online, uh, you can check it out at, on the community data science workshops um, and have uh, explicitly decided not just to teach people to engage in in sort of to, to, to have software which they can use, but really to sort of take advantage of that software and change it in various ways. Um, if you make it a goal to to spread to to give people the tools, right? There are we've been oversubscribed um, by a factor of almost 100 percent every time that we've tried to do this. We're now teaching 100 people at a time, twice a year. Um, the curriculum has been picked up, and people are teaching similar sort of um, uh, learning uh, Python and programming workshops more broadly um, in various places. Um, Open Hatch is uh, another project which is very active in this in a way that I think is actually really smart. Uh, Open Hatch has a series of events which they have, which they are running, and which you can run. The curriculum is online, which are designed to teach people who are already participants in, sorry, already uh, users of free and open source software how to contribute. Um, uh, they, for example, teach people how to use Git. They teach them about the social processes in projects. They teach people about submitting patches or engaging in, mail, in, in mailing lists. Um, there, there are, this is the hack on free software party, right? Um, that, that, that should come after our install free software party, but that historically we have really not usually gotten to. I think that the most important thing to realize is that I think that, uh, um, is that, is that although that, you know, you know, those are a series of ideas of things that we can do, but I think the important thing to realize is that if we take this really seriously, if we make engagement with you know, sort of promoting empowerment, a first order goal in the same way that we have made using free software um, or access to free software, a first order goal in the past, we can do much better. Um, when I first uh, uh, was talking about the idea for this talk to uh, Walter Bender, at, uh, who's very involved with Sugar Labs, which is a project connected to the One Laptop Per Child project, sort of comes from that. And it's an interface for kids um, to use a free software tool to use as their sort of operating system. Um, he sort of, uh, I don't know, had a very inspiring sort of um, uh, approach to this. The, this, is a, this is a program called Turtle Art. It's one of these block-based languages, a lot like Scratch, where kids can use to program, make their own programs, which itself is kind of cool because now we have a piece of educational software that is not just a software that you can use to uh, you know, use your computer, but you can actually use to program it. But the coolest thing about it um, is that uh, is that this lives up to an old OLPC goal, which is that for every in this program there's a view source button. It's right up in the corner, and if you press on it, um, uh, you will see the source code to the program that you are actually running. So not only can you write your own programs here, but you can actually press the view source button, and you can see the Python code that implements this turtle art, and you can change that code to make it work in a different way, right? Um, uh, they, they have, at least in the context of turtle art, and to some extent in sugar more broadly, made engagement and empowerment something which is a first order goal. That it's not enough that every, it's not just that everyone will have access to the source code and can change it. There is a button right in that interface which allows you to see and to begin changing the software that you are using. The, um, but of course, the inspiring part is not, just, is, the, is not just that this exists, but that people are taking advantage of it. Uh, Walter told me that during the last release of Sugar, a majority of the patches that went into, the, into Sugar, the last release of Sugar, actually came from kids. Um, kids, many of them in Uruguay, where the largest number of users are, who are uh, using this software and who are changing this software to fix bugs to make it work in different ways. That if we do this, if we start and design our stuff with the goal of with a goal of empowerment that is as important and central in our actions and our principles as uh, as important in our actions as it is in our principles, we can make real progress. And it falls on 
us, right? People like people like us in this room, the advocates of free software, to uh, address this. Um, we, you know, you uh, uh, run and contribute to and influence, you know, many of the most uh, successful and influential free software projects. And what's at stake here is more than the particular our particular projects, but the broader movement. Because when people realize that we can, they can change their technology, their technological world, and when they are willing and able to do it, they are able to take control of their experience in a way that is profoundly powerful. The potential is there and can be realized in ways that I've suggested, um, and there are lots of other ways that I haven't. Um, if we try, uh, you know, your work here is very important, and thanks for letting me be a small part of it. Cool. So, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, I guess there's time for a question or two. Yeah, sure. I'll repeat the question. All right, so the question is, the question is about uh, sort of like how much should one have to learn to be empowered, right? Um, uh, uh, is it, you know, in terms of system programming or simple scripting, something like this? I think for me, so the analogy that I keep coming back to is this idea of writing versus, like writing versus, uh, writing brim programming, right? Um, uh, we don't insist that, like, I don't think it would be reasonable to, ins to insist that everyone should be a professional journalist or writer, um, nor do I think that it's important that everyone be able to you know, be a system programmer or be able to design the chips that run in their computers. Um, I think that the question is at which point do you, I think that the, the goal should be to demystify programming and to put people in a position where they believe that they can, they, that they understand how they could change their computer to make it work uh, more difficult um, uh, in, in various ways. In my own work, um, I teach, uh, I like teaching Python in part because I think that uh, you can, it's very easy to show that you could use Python to do anything from building like working graphical applications to, I can point to real websites that people use all the time, you know, Instagram written in Python, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, uh, or, or, you know, and, and people can begin to be, feel like they're changing things right, right at first. So. Um, uh, I don't know, I think it's an open question and I think it's something that we'll sort of figure out, um, but that's how I've sort of engaged with it myself. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is should empowerment also involve documentation? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think that, that um, I mean, for me, I think of the, that, uh, you know, I'm also very active in the Wikimedia community and Wikipedia, and I see, I see work in that space as basically falling short in exactly the same way. I have like a, you know, I can give the version of this talk which is like informed but unempowered, which is exactly about, uh, you know, Wikimedia, and which comes down to issues of documentation. I think that insofar as the documentation is an important part of the way in which we experience the software or experience the world or understand the software in the world, that uh, sort of the ability to engage in that also becomes important. There are lots of ways to become engaged and lots of ways to sort of transcend one role as just a consumer of software or information goods. And I think the documentation is one way to do that. So I think that's a great point. Uh, yeah.
Uh, I'm not going to try to repeat that whole thing. But uh, uh, the, the point was that that, uh, that encouraging that designing systems and encouraging people to be willing to take risks um, uh, is a type of compromise that we uh, should be willing to make in order to promote uh, engagement with and empowerment um, uh, in terms of software, free software more broadly, and other things as well. So uh, that's a great point. Um, uh, I just want to take. I want to be aware that people are moving in. So maybe we'll. we'll is that okay? If we. Okay. So we'll switch over to the next speaker, but I will talk to you right now.